Welcome to this episode of the ASHA podcast. I'm Fred Wyant with the American Sexual Health Association, ASHA. We've had a lot of discussion on this podcast around syphilis, especially the alarming rates of the infection in newborns. But today we're talking about syphilis and ocular or eye infections, in particular, syphilitic uveitis, a disease affecting the uvea, the middle layer of the eye. It's not all that common, but it's been increasing in recent years, and it can really damage somebody's vision if it's not diagnosed and treated. So to learn more, we're fortunate to be joined by Dr. Megan Birkenstock, an associate professor of ophthalmology at the Johns Hopkins Wilmer Eye Institute, and she specializes in the care of patients with uveitis. So Dr. Birkenstock, thank you and welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is really a topic, to my knowledge, we have never delved into it all. So I'm glad to have this opportunity. And I first became aware of you and your work when I read a paper that you did with some colleagues. You published on syphilitic uveitis trends based, as I recall, on a review of a database where that captures the diagnosis along with co-infections with HIV and other STIs. Does that sound about right? Yeah, totally. We uh, just published in the American Journal of Ophthalmology about a month ago, and we wanted to look at the rates over the United States in total, because a lot of the papers that talked about this before were just from local health departments or on statewide levels. And so we wanted to look at how it affects everyone across the United States. And so using a uh, database that is uh, anonymized and available that is generated through information from multiple healthcare organizations over many states um, enabled us to do that. And I think what we we found mirrored what the CDC had already been posting that not only are the rates of syphilis going up, but ocular syphilis, um, especially syphilitic uveitis or inflammation in the eye from it is increasing across the board. So let me, uh, Go to the basics to begin with. What is uveitis in general and what's unique about the disease when it's caused by syphilis? That's a great question. So uveitis affects one to 2% of the U.S. population and it's an inflammation inside the eye. I like how you said it was the middle coat of the eye because that's exactly it. So it involves the iris, so the colored um, part of the front of the eye that we all see when we look at each other, but also layers behind it, including the ciliary body and also a layer underneath the retina, which is the part of the eye that helps us see a supporting layer called the choroid. So if any of those become inflamed, that's the name uveitis. And and what's interesting about syphilis is that it can take any kind of presentation or look like any other cause of ocular inflammation in the eye or other ocular conditions. And so in medicine, we like to call it the great mimicker, and it certainly mm -hmm. is in the eye. And so as a physician, you need to have a really low threshold to figure out, okay, and we certainly don't judge and we don't profile. I check in on everybody. I check a treponemal test and a non-treponemal test for this because I don't want to miss it because not only does it affect the patient and if left untreated, as our paper showed, it can cause um, blindness and some other complications in the eye, um, including swelling of the retina, but also it affects other people because it's a sexually transmitted disease. Mm. So that, okay, my mind's already going and branching off in a number of directions. Mm -hmm. First, how common is, is syphilitic uveitis? Um, our publication showed it's about 0 0.3 in 100,000 persons. Wow. So it's rare. But nonetheless, if you can imagine that rate doubling over time, it's on the rise. Yeah. And that's the thing, right? Just it's like your paper said, watching the trends. Um, so how do you diagnose and treat this? Right. So again, the healthy dose of suspicion and checking um, syphilis serologies, both an RPR or a non-treponemal test and a treponemal test, so a TPPA or an FTA absorption. Uh, and you have to do both because there was another paper in, in our literature in the uveitis subspecialty of ophthalmology that said, if you don't check both, you'll miss about a third of cases. And so we check both um, after the patient presents with any kind of uveitis, so nonspecific uveitis inflammation in the eye, and then we follow up the testing. And if positive, the CDC gave us clearance to be called neurocephalus with ocular involvement, and that's new within the last few years. And so that requires two weeks of IV penicillin, no more IM or intramuscular administrations of penicillin for treatment. And then we follow along with corticosteroid eye drops to calm the inflammation in the eye while going to the root cause 
cause, which is the giving of the antibiotics to treat the syphilis infection. Okay, so one of the places my mind went to with one of your previous uh, uh, responses was transmission. Um, so, well, is, is syphilitic uveitis a complication only if systemic infection where syphilis spreads throughout the system? Or could you get this through direct inoculation like somebody's eye literally makes contact with an infectious mm -hmm. syphilitic lesion? Sure. No, it's a great question. Most of the time it is through a bloodstream infection that you get the intraocular inflammation, but you can get syphilitic conjunctivitis. So if you touch your eye with an infected chancre or infected um, fluids, and then you can get more external disease. So in this case, pink eye or conjunctivitis, a bacterial form of it, but um, for uveitis, it's bloodborne. What what kind of complications can this cause if, it, if it's not detected and treated? It can lead ultimately to blindness, which is defined as 2200 vision or worse. So it's one line lower than the big E on the letter charts, um, but it can cause high pressures in the eye, which can lead to glaucoma, uh, which can cause damage in the optic nerve. It can lead to retinal swelling in the back of the eye, which can lead to vision loss because the retina can atrophy or shrink over time due to the continued swelling. It can also cause cataract formation. And although cataracts can be removed, one of the things as a cataract surgeon, in addition to a uveitis specialist, it can weaken the fibers that hold up the lens in your eye called the zonules. And so it makes complicated or the surgery for cataracts a little bit more complicated. In your paper, I read that about 75% of those with syphilitic uveitis were male, mm -hmm. and approximately a third of them had an HIV co-infection. Is, mm -hmm. is there a health equity angle here? Is this a disease that disproportionately affects men who have sex with men, for example? Yeah, I think it's, it's a great question, and um, that's why I don't um, profile anybody who comes into my clinic with uveitis. I think uh, we found a large proportion of men who have sex with men ultimately having syphilitic uveitis, but the paper also showed too that um, the average age was um, a little bit older than in the database. And so, yes, absolutely one proportion of patients who have been affected are men who have sex with men, but it is an equal opportunity infector. And so even anyone of any age range should be tested and screened because we're finding an aging uh, population who also are susceptible to contracting syphilis. When we talk about prevention with syphilis uh, in general, you know, we, we go through the usual things. We talk about uh, barriers like condoms, for example. But we also talk about the value of again, testing and prompt treatment is, is breaking the disease cycle. Um, is there anything we need to add to that when we're talking about ocular infections and syphilitic uveitis in particular? Or is prevention just pretty much the same old, same old that we talk about with syphilis in general? Exactly. Preventing the, the ounce of prevention is worth the pound of cure. So preventing the infection can then prevent the inflammation down the road because at any point in the journey through syphilis, whether it's as soon as you get syphilis or later on, if someone develops tertiary syphilis, you can have inflammation in the eye. And also listening to your body, if you see your vision is off or you have redness or pain or any other changes, have a low threshold to go see your ophthalmologist. You know, one of the barriers with sexually transmitted infections and getting the proper care is just shame and stigma. People are embarrassed to talk about these things. Um, and that can also work with healthcare providers too. They're not always comfortable. They may have their own biases. I mean, there's, there's a, there's, we spend a lot of time dealing with that. Do you think ophthalmologists are sort of primed to deal with eye infections that stem from STIs? Is that something, do they train you on that? How do you interact? Just how does that whole dynamic work? No, it's a great question. And, and I'm, I'm so happy you ask about it because as ophthalmologists, we are MDs. And so we got trained in medical school about systemic infections, but also even in our residency, we, we certainly encounter it. And that goes for gonorrhea and chlamydia associated conjunctivitis. We, we actively ask the questions. I feel completely comfortable asking somebody about it. And I, I'm upfront with them. I'm like, so there's a few diseases here that could be sexually transmitted. I know I just met you, but we're going to be best friends pretty soon. And I'm going to ask you a few questions. And usually people will light up and it just kind of breaks that ice that I feel like sometimes people need in order to... It, people still think of it as like a taboo subject. It's only taboo and that I can't help you if you don't bring it up with me. And, and in order to make that 
happen, I have to make you feel comfortable and that you also trust me. And so I try to do that right away with my patients. But yes, ophthalmologists should be well versed on how to take care of this. And if we're not sure, but we get a positive test, we can always work with your primary care doctor as well to figure out, well, what's the latest guidance for this treatment or that treatment? Because it's fluid over time. So we always like to offer patients and the lay public who, who our primary audience for these podcasts, we always like to offer them an action step or some tips or something, or just something to help them navigate this. So if you could, if you were doing your elevator speech, a 30 second message to somebody who might be thinking, why should I worry about this? I don't think it really applies to me. What would you just say? Oh, I want you to know this. What would that be? I think it can happen to anybody. And if you have any kind of ocular signs or symptoms, even if it's not syphilis, just come and see us. It's so much easier as a physician to treat you and make sure everything is okay earlier than later when there could be complications or you never really want to have the shoulda, woulda, coulda in life. And that's what we're here for. And we're available and affable and more than capable to take care of a lot of things, including syphilitic uveitis. All right. We've been talking with Dr. Megan Birkenstock. Um, we'll link to the paper in the show notes that I mentioned that you and your colleagues published on the trends with syphilitic uveitis. Um, even for a, a lay audience, read the abstract that there's a lot of good, a lot of good stuff there. This was the topic I literally knew nothing about. Uh, I had a general perception of ocular syphilis, but really nothing, certainly nothing like on the level of dealing with uveitis. So uh, this your paper was helpful. And so is this conversation. Thank you for your time to this. I mean, really, this is like I said, this is not an area where I really see sexual health stakeholders doing a lot of work, you know? So I appreciate you helping us uh, bring some attention to it. Thank, thank you so much again, Dr. Birkenstock. Thanks for having me and helping me spread the word. Uh, glad to do it. And thank you intrepid listeners as always for joining us. Keep in touch. Uh, we're at info at ashesexualhealth.org and we'll see you next time.